Uh, we're going to talk about strategy. We're going to talk about the strategy of getting your organization to move in the correct direction for managing accessibility on an ongoing basis. Right? Um, and uh, what I really want to do is hear from all of you uh, why you're here, what's important to you, what stage you're in. Uh, I'm glad to see not too big a group. I didn't really expect to see a very big big group, but I wonder, if you don't mind, can we go through uh, everyone really quickly and just give a, a, your, your first name or whatever information you want and, and what you uh, need to do with accessibility over the next, say, six to 18, 18 months. Are you guys game for it? So I'm Ray Saltini. Uh, I'm the director of Center of Excellence, FFW. We're a diamond sponsor. We're really fortunate uh, to be able to do that every year. I'm super fortunate because I spend most of my time talking to folks, hitting microphones, learning from people. So, Rich. Uh, yeah, Rich Pana, Sunbrook University. Accessibility is a big thing for Stephen University. So, constantly always kind of monitoring and make sure all this works. And I'm going to borrow from some of Rich's work uh, in a, a, little, a little bit later on. Chris Kane, Princeton Black Physics Laboratory. It's a federal laboratory, and the federal government has just changed accessibility laws. Uh, so January 18th, we have to have closed captioning for videos, uh, color contrasts, alt tags. This is now a federal law, so our website has to be fine. That's why This is a hurry up and wait scenario, yeah. because we've been waiting for those guidelines for a long time, and now they're hitting us in the back of the head. Yeah. Yes. Very good, thank you, Chris. Hi, I'm Jessica Bladen, um, co-founder of Crowd Communications Group. Um, over the last year or so, we've really been focusing a lot on um, web accessibility and helping um, businesses and universities um, update their sites to be accessible. That's awesome, and Jessica is one of the reasons why you are here today, because she is a major mover and shifter uh, in the community and organizer, so thank you. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. So, let's, let's go. Hi, my name is Gary. I'm from Chappers. Uh, I, I'm a company, my company is in Europe. I moved to New York City a year ago, and I'm the other branch of okay. Welcome. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Michael Lake and I work with Gergen, so. Wonderful. Welcome. Good, good. I'm Patrick Jensen. I work for the ACLU. Um, I think we're doing pretty well. Um, as far as accessibility goes, but always looking to have, um, improve things. Super. Yeah. All right. Hi, my name is Georgia Chalker, and I work for the Department of Geosciences. I just completed a, a accessibility cert certification from the Accessibility Department here at Princeton. It was an eye-opener as far as uh, what opportunities this opens to the disabled community. Mm -hmm. And I hope to integrate that into my own department. I'm a little, you know, I, 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 I'm aware of what needs to be done on the surface of, you know, site building, but are there other things that I need to be doing? Um, and how am I going to get other people in the department on board with that? That's my concern. Excellent. Okay, and I'm going to try to help with that today. Thank you. Uh -huh. Very good. I guess it's me. Uh, my name is Keith Doyle. I work for SEI Investments. Um, and we just launched our first Drupal site in January. Uh, we rebranded completely. So the next phase of that is pushing out accessibility guides, guidelines to the rest of the company. Good to see you, Keith. Thank you. See you. Good to see you. Thank you. Hi. Hey, my name is Diego Restrepo. I'm from Colombia. I came. Uh, with before to uh, training. Uh, I work for Prodigious uh, company in Colombia. So Very good. Very good. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is John Kazer. I'm a front end developer at ZipTech. We're a client services company. So I kind of want to make sure that I'm always adhering to an business. awesome client services company, ZipTech, long standing member of the community, the open source community in Drupal. Thank you. Good. Um, I'm and thank you for coming back for more. Yes. <laughs> uh, um, uh, we're we're going to cover a little bit of new ground in this session, not too much, but okay. I, I never say the same thing the same way twice, um, and I probably should, but thank you. Hi. Hi, I'm Maria Carolina Semeo. I just finished a PhD in environmental science. Woo! 
round of applause. Okay. <laughs> but unfortunately, I discovered I don't want to be a professor. Ah. So I'm looking for a career change. I'm very interested in web development and don't know the first thing about accessibility in terms of websites. Okay, well, we're going to fill up your calendar for the next six months. <laughs> All right. Okay? Awesome. We've got plenty of things for you to, for you to do. Hi. I'm Cara Barth. I'm a front end developer and web accessibility lead at a uh, message agency in Philadelphia. Um, and my goal is to stop having web accessibility be something that we do in the QA period. Yeah, there we go. Very good. You know, in planning. Well, you're, you're, it is great that you're doing it, period. And um, good. So uh, I, I was going to save it for the end, but now it's just been. I can't hold myself back any lo longer. So part of my role here is to uh, help everyone become evangelists for web accessibility and also a customer experience, right? Because the folks who benefit from accessibility technologies are our constituents, our customers, uh, and. Uh, People like to talk about customer experience these days, right? And if they understand just how big a part of uh, accessibility uh, is uh, to customer experience and to UX, it sets it in a completely different light. So as opposed to just something you get fined for or as an off uh, afterthought. So, all right, jeez. Um, come on. Uh, Jim Birch, I'm a strategist at Xenomedia in Chicago. Um, I do accessibility and I've been uh, in it for a long time. Uh, my father was blind, so I grew up listening to the big Jaws box on top of his there we go. XT. Um, so yeah, now I do the more of the technical side, you know, running Lighthouse reports and running through web and Well, and we all stand on the shoulders of giants, uh, so thank you for being here and for acknowledge the work that you've done uh, in the field be be before, and it's so difficult for uh, uh, folks that are temporarily able-bodied to put themselves in the position of folks who are uh, not at the mo at, at, at the moment, uh, and when you have um, a constituency or an allied uh, um, uh, set of folks, family members, uh, that's one way to do it. Uh, so, thank you. I'm Asha Leo. I am a web developer at the University. Welcome. Yes, not to be an afterthought. Yep. Yeah, we're, uh, we kind of want it to be a Brilliant. Have more than just one person. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Yeah, and have everybody care about it and yeah. talk about it and bring it forward. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Dean Palmar, I'm a web content administrator for Prince of the Services. Uh, several sites that um, are going to be audited uh, because they're essential services for students. So um, I'm going to want to get Excellent, excellent, thank you. Yeah, my name is uh, Shyam, I work for uh, a developer for the state of New York. I've seen you before. So. And, where, and where are you developed for? Uh, state of New York. Oh, wonderful, yes, yes. Good. Yeah. And some of our global training days and the like? Uh, yeah. Yeah, good, good, good. Uh, thanks for being down. I was talking to Tom uh, er, earlier, and I know he's moved on, but still in the same universe. Yeah, I'm going to plug his se session a, 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 a little bit, too. So, hi. My name is Greg. I'm a system administrator of formal communications, and I'm just personally interested in accessibility. Another, another great Drupal organization. Thank you very much. Great. Hi, I'm Katie Coyce. I'm the project manager for the Office of the Provost um, and uh, web project manager. So the Office of the Provost is the one that monitors all of the accessibility on campus at Princeton. And I want to make sure that our website is a banner site for Yay. Wonderful. Hi, I'm Lindsay Cowan. I'm a developer at Jordan's Hospital Columbia Research Institute. Um, oh, awesome. We're in the early stages of design, so um, no one's really thinking about this. And it's been like a little oh, book. Yeah. Um, so we're hoping to start the same thing. Start early and not turn out Excellent. Excellent. And very important for an organization like yours, I'm sure. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> David's here too, you gotta say hello. Yeah, good. So we're just trying in the next phase to make our site WCG for the Yeah, and College of Staten Island has made a 
big com commitment to it. They're really trying to get ahead of the curve. Uh, so uh, good to see you, R Roman. So part of introdu this, these introductions, of course, was for me to hear from you. But the biggest and most important part is now you know who the evangelists are for accessibility at the camp today. And there are probably others outside that were really torn about being able to come to this session. But what I hope some of you do is start a boff, okay, afterwards or maybe at the next event that's, that's coming up and really push this issue and start talking about it because there is actually a tremendous body of work uh, that's done on it. So without further ado, um, I'm Ray Saltini. I'm celebrating my Drupal anniversary uh, every year at this camp, February 1, 12 years. Yikes, as Brian was saying, was saying as he was leaving, uh, as, as Brian, uh, like no other can do, hi, Ray, you're really looking old. Um, <laughs> and, and yes, so I, I, but I'm not feeling old. Uh, and that part of the reason is because I get the privilege of working with another great Drupal organization and doing some really great Drupal work. Uh, this presentation is part of this series, which ostensibly focuses on, focuses on how we can do audits in such a way to move important agendas forward in organizations around specific projects. And it's an audit series, but it's really in the context of customer experience. We've got one more left to go on per performance. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I hope some of you um, visit the site and join us. So um, we're here to talk about, though, obviously, accessibility in this context. And in particular, the um, MAT, uh, the audit, uh, accessibility audit. Uh, uh, accessibility audits are a thing. Um, for those of you that have talked about accessibility, you may not have talked about an accessibility audit. You probably talked about uh, accessibility scanning and evaluations and testing. Um, and what we're here to do, what I'm here to do, is uh, urge you and your organization to consider a formal audit process. Um, audits are beloved everywhere. People jump to get audited. Uh, it's like going to the dentist. We do it all the time because we know how good it is for us. So uh, we want to set, set the record straight. This is not that kind of audit, even though it may not feel much better. Because implied, of course, in an audit is the fact that other folks are going to judge you or your organization and what, or what you've done. Um, but audits, like going to the dentist, are indeed good for us. Uh, accessibility audits in particular uh, can be good for us. But let's level the playing field here and go through some basic understandings uh, around accessibility, some of the drivers behind access accessibility, of which we just heard a few. And let's try to, um, let's try to become more prepared to be evangelists in our organizations to move these things into the front, uh, front part of the brains of our colleagues as well. Uh, because this is, after all, a strategy class. So, some basic understandings. Web accessibility. Not a blank page. Actually been here for a really long time. And we're talking more and more about it. This is an important concept, okay? because there are some folks that have been fighting this fight for a really long time and have been at it. And although they um, uh, are the first, probably, I think, uh, I have certain evidence that I see to, to remind as many folks as they can that we need to do much more, okay, they are also among the folks who acknowledge how far we have come. And in order to join the good fight, if you will, it's important to know that we can make progress on these fronts. Uh, and so I want you to consider we're not starting from a blank page. Okay? Uh, in fact, uh, this web accessibility um, uh, dates back to the early period of the internet. All right? It's not something that uh, we've just came to. Uh, it is well defined and sometimes very vague and very mushy and difficult to uh, implement 
and adhere to um, because there's a still currently a pretty significant disconnect between guidelines and actual requirements. And so I'm going to do a tiny bit of trying to outline that, that out for folks so that we can give our development teams guidance. But I'm going to fly through this stuff really quickly. I'm going to offer everybody copies of the slide deck. Um, this information is all out there publicly. Hopefully it's helpful to have it curated just a bit and put into one place. So I'm going to fly through this and then I want to spend a little bit of time talking about um, what we said we were going to talk about and that is building a, um, a method to continually maintain accessibility on all your sites. Because even though I'm here to talk about how great an audit is, even though we're all here to try to make our sites compliant, the real challenge is in keeping our sites compliant, right? We are not working with a static system, right? We are, our projects, generally speaking, will be in continuous development. Ergo, we have to have systems for continuous compliance. So uh, l later on, we're gonna talk about uh, a component-based design system uh, that is, you couldn't have uh, dreamt up a better so solution, all right? And we've got some component-based design experts in the room as well that I'll invite to uh, speak about it if they, if they like, besides making uh, ri Rich my uh, uh, prime example, all right? So uh, web accessibility, you know, with accessibility on the web, we are still talking about all the uh, areas that are covered in the ADA. Um, it, 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 these um, uh, are er, these areas are often overlooked. Clearly, the visual area is not overlooked, right? But in understanding accessibility, it's very easy to lose sight very quickly of some of these other areas. So. Uh, we're going to keep them in mind. We're going to look at some of the business drivers uh, behind this. The great thing about it is even if we do lose sight of the other um, areas and just have uh, visual acuity um, front, front brain, it helps us bring along all the other areas that we need to address with regard to accessibility as well. So um, the good news is that more and more of us will need uh, accessibility support uh, sooner as opposed to later, right? And some of us who uh, have a little bit more white hair uh, than others will need it even sooner. Uh, but there is an inexorable societal pressure that is being brought to bear uh, around accessibility. Uh, for a lot of folks, um, they are beginning to understand that this is not just about heavy fines, this is about significant markets of individuals. This is not an altruistic um, pers uh, perspective or driver, but it is an extremely helpful one, nonetheless. And so a lot of people are gonna need assistive technologies uh, more and more very quickly. It was established uh, a quite a bit of time uh, ago that the ADA is not just for bricks and, and mortar, but more recently we are seeing that um, uh, other or organizations other than just universities and publicly funded places are um, being uh, hit with fines or realizing the value of compliance. And so I picked the target case because it's one of the first. Uh, but effectively, the state of California brought a class action suit against Target. Target fought it. Target lost. Target had to pay a lot of money in lawyers' fees, and they had to pay a lot more money in setting up a fund to support other accessibility issues. Three, four years after that case was settled, uh, the um, National Federation for the Blind made Target.com, a, a gave them a gold certification for accessibility. 
Uh, it didn't take very long for Target to realize the value of providing this type of accessibility uh, support on their properties. And so there are organizations, regardless of the drivers, all over, so many of you are part of, part of them, that are moving in this dire direction. And in many cases, the regulations lag behind what you are all willing to do. And that, of course, slows things down. So as evangelists, unfortunately, you have to navigate some of these issues so that your developers can build accordingly. Uh, so you need to be equipped with all the resources that I'm going to cite and then some here. But you also need to start thinking about asking your organization to conduct a formal audit. And a formal audit can be internal, I think, and I'm going to recommend that it be conducted by an outside external organization because, unfortunately, we live in a society where uh, folks on our teams internally uh, who are in a position to know the best about a subject uh, are often devalued and their opinions count for a lot less than an expensive consultant's time who will gladly tell you uh, what time it is. Uh, so uh, there's a little bit of a, a, a double-edged sword, two sides of the coin here, but we're talking not about being validated, we're talking about uh, improving accessibility and creating accessibility strategies. So um, some of these business dr drivers who I've just spoke, spoken about, right? Um, now let's talk a little bit about technical best practice. Um, and again, forgive me for going just at warp speed uh, over, over, over here. We have until uh, 1235, I think, correct? Uh, and we're gonna, I'm going to get a warning 15 minutes um, before the, the or end of it, and we'll have 10 minutes for questions. Um, and so I think we've got a good solid 20 minutes, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fly through there. And um, uh, don't hesitate to interrupt me with, with questions, and please certainly do save some questions for that last 10 minutes. I'll do my best to answer them or point you in the right direction. We're going to have the, a discussion so we can all answer them. So some basic principles. Uh, are, are really good to keep very close, right, when building and renovating websites. Um, as uh, uh, some folks from Princeton can, can attest, some folks that were in my uh, class yesterday on uh, uh, customer experience, uh, actionable strategies for uh, improved customer experience, of which this was a part of, can say, they have a very hard time with their orange branding or their orange and black branding, right? So uh, when you come up with an issue that's that big, uh, would you rather be you know, the person in the room telling their head of communications or marketing or your provost that they have to change the colors of the 250-year-old organization? What is it, 1750-something? excuse me, in the case of Princeton, um, or would you rather have pay somebody else some money to do it uh, and have the consultant tell them what time it is? So um, there are a lot of reasons to, to uh, have this done externally, and, and some of them relate to these uh, not-so-common, common-sense bullet points around accessibility. Right? Um, and as we can, can see, some of these are much you know, harder to do and accomplish if you've got a body of work already published that has not been closed captioned to begin with. So let's get a little closer to the ground with some of these best practices and how they tie specifically in, into the law and how you can set about creating a strong strategy uh, for accessibility and customer experience. So uh, the basic foundation around accessibility is that content must be perceivable, operable, uh, understandable, and robust. Okay, And what you must do is provide the groundwork not just for the, what folks see on their screen okay, in, the, in their browser, to be all those four things, but also for those JAWS appliances that sit on people's um, monitors and desktops 
to be able to interpret that information. So as part of the um, uh, responsibility around accessibility, we must not just provide the individual end user with uh, the foundations necessary, but we must provide their assistive technologies with the ability to clearly interpret, to be able to perceive, operate, understand in a robust fashion what's being conveyed on that internet site. So I'm not going to read through bullet <coughs> lists, excuse me, but you all can as I continue chatting about them or coughing myself. Uh, so, I mean, I can, can pers uh, you know, there are some examples of this which might be helpful. So when per perceivable, we talk about alternative text and text-only website equivalents, um, assistive technologies such as JAWS that need to be supported, text and audio transcripts of video and audio uh, features, re removing the reliance on shape, size, location, color, or sound, to navigate, okay? So there's two sides of that. We want to re 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 remove uh, shape, size, location, color elements that are difficult to perceive, but we especially want to remove them when they present difficulties um, in navigating that apply to the structure of your sites. Um, use of keyword alternatives for site navigation Timeouts. Now, timeouts are not as common as they used to be on the web, but they still happen. If you uh, are using t assistive technologies, uh, if you find it difficult to perceive what's going on or around you on the screen, you've worked very hard to figure out where you are on a website, and then all of a sudden, click, four seconds goes by or however, however long, and you're lost again and must need to find yourself. So timeouts are a huge no-no. Um, Automatic redirects would fit into the same category, um, and certainly alternative means of navigation like site maps and tables of content. Often, these are the first things to get thrown out by our awesome design team colleagues, right? Because they are difficult to really make impactful and graceful, right? They are content heavy. These are heavy, heavy elements, right, of text. And so we need to set up not a confrontational relationship with those folks, but a relationship based around understanding of people's needs. Um, and we probably, unfortunately, don't accomplish that by talking to them about the importance of accessibility, because that's often not their first language. Their first language is UI, UX, and design. And when we help them understand that all these things that we're talking about are part of presenting good UX, then they're a lot more willing to listen, right? And we are talking about strategies here today. So, uh, you know, honey, salt, whatever analogy works, you get the point. So, um, am I on the right uh, page here? I think I might have skipped one. Anyway. I think I'm talking enough about it. So um, multilingual sections, there are lots of folks who speak lots of different languages who need assistive technologies. So add a whole nother layer onto it. Are your users occasionally multilingual or frequently multilingual? Are they one, two, three different um, additional languages? Um, I want to breeze through these best practices. How many folks are familiar with the I I idea of skipping navigation? Right? So the uh, basic idea is assistive technologies will sometimes read through the navigation. We take for granted the fact that we can scan, scan a page very quickly. Okay, they off, folks, other folks often have to use assistive technologies in order to scan the skip navigation to temporarily able-bodied folks seems sort of counterintuitive, right? But what we're really talking about is allowing other folks get at the content 
much faster, as fast as we can get at the content because we can scan it very quickly. Um, a good resource, whether or not the regulation applies to you, is 508 and is accessible. Most folks nowadays are have done a decent job of level A. Oh yeah, these gifts are really annoying. I'm sorry, I'm not going to do these anymore. Um, so, uh, most folks have done a good job of uh, reaching some level of compliance. And a lot of folks these days are talking about going to level two or level three, right? And level two uh, is not, not a trivial task. Level three, for a lot of folks, is Herculean, okay? Depending upon how much you've, you've got. What an audit will do is help you do a risk analysis of moving your organization through from one stage of compliance to the, uh, the next stage of compliance. You're an organization like College of Staten Island will be able to say, okay, we know we want to get to AAA, okay, but maybe we have to go to AA first, or maybe we can get 60 or 70 or 80% of our site at AA certification levels, okay, and then we have to hold off on AAA until we replatform. Right? And an audit will help your organization understand how to chart a course through these different certification levels. Okay? It, 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 understanding the certification levels is difficult enough as it is. Charting a course for your organization and your development team to meet these uh, cri criteria is even more, more difficult. The more structure that you can lend it, the, the stronger roadmap that you can put to get together, the faster you're going to be able to go, the more manageable you're going to be able to go, the, the, the more informed decision makers are, are going to be in your organization about spending resources, okay, and about raising the consciousness and importance of this to begin with. So, um, what we will uh, do here uh, is go through a list of what I think are some useful links. Some of you may be very aware of, others may not be. You're going to get a copy uh, of, of this. I'm actually not sure how everybody's going to get a copy of this, but my contact information is here. So please contact me if you want a copy uh, of, uh, of this. And I'm, I'm always thinking training, and I know who everybody in the room is. I have emails and the like. So please reach out to either me or the camp, and I will post these publicly uh, uh, and make them av av available. Uh, and I, I can certainly even make them available on our website so that you can come back to them. Yeah, but, they usually put the slides on the on Yeah, actually, it's, rec it's recorded, and I do post the slides. Duh, thank you. Okay, um, so general resources, testers, color testers, screen reader readers, code markup validators. There are lots of resources available. Some of them ain't so good. Don't use one, use several. Some of them are really good suites. Some of them are really great standalone testers. Early, often, don't use one. Are these free or are these Most of these on this l a list are free or have freemium schemes b behind them. But that was um, something that I tried to, tried to do in putting them together. So that at least you can begin to pick at it. You know? Now, use them, use them well. If you hire a firm to do an audit, some of them have their own uh, testing tools. Awesome. Um, some of them will use these. Uh, you, uh, in doing an audit, um, are essentially establishing a baseline for your organization. It's certainly important to understand uh, whether you are compliant or not. What you want to be talking about is being continuously compliant, and what you need to know is did that change so-and-so make last week 
improve my compliance, hurt my compliance, or just be neutral. And the only way to do that is to get a strong baseline on several different uh, measurement points. And that's another reason for you and your organization to go through a formal audit process. Okay, because, you know, um, uh, analog snapshots of how compliant you are at any given point in time are much less me meaningful and much more helpful when you have that actual baseline. So, um, now what I want to do here is talk a little bit about what I think needs to be leveraged as an awesome solution to our accessibility challenges, particularly being, being continuously compliant in this area. The web, and certainly Drupal, uh, has moved from cathode ray tubes and responsive displays to style tiles to now a very atomic way of thinking and designing and developing. This is a really good thing for accessibility evangelists and technologists working with all, all organizations that have to be compliant. And if you don't know about it, I'm here to tell you about it and to, and, and to, to sing its praises a little bit uh, and show you just how uh, it has been used, uh, it will, and, and how it can be used. So um, atomic design uh, comes out of a lot of different traditions. The guy who gets the credit for writing the book is up there on the screen, okay, and he, get, he deserves all the credit that he can, can get for it because it's very well articulated. In a nutshell, if you haven't heard about it before, atomic design is. And uh, it, it is quite literal in the sense that we are working from the most uh, elemental uh, of, uh, of aspects up to the page. And uh, in, in Drupal, many of you probably know, we have a module called Paragraphs that facilitates the, um, uh, atomic design and component building. Uh, after lunch, we have a, a class uh, by Tom Atkins on paragraphs. I spoke to him earlier. He's going to address it from the point of view of accessibility as well. He's a talented developer, a great guy. You can take guitar lessons from him as well. So um, atomic design, like I say, is quite literal. And it really enables organizations to begin building out their styles and libraries in a way that must be compliant, right? From grid patterns to layouts to colors to the combination of different colors, it is quite literally environmental, right? A periodic table of elements. Who would have thunk it, okay? Um, but this is the type of thing that, that can actually be done using the atomic design pattern. Now, there is a problem with this. The problem with this, of course, is it's an awful lot easier for you to do this when you are building from scratch. And if you have an existing site, it's a heck of a lot more difficult to implement. It is not impossible, okay? And you can certainly borrow the concept of building from the most basic level on up and incorporate that into your current scheme. Or you can see one of the really excellent firms that are in the room about building a brand new site for you in Drupal. Um, or if you have a deep enough bench doing it for, you, for yourself. But regardless of whether or not you have um, an existing site with some really impending needs, um, you want to plan for the future. Because these regulations, as Chris was able to evidence, are, are in a hurry up and wait state all the time. We've been waiting, waiting, waiting for these uh, guidelines to yield, you know, actual procedures and, and criteria in all different sectors. And, and when it finally does happen, if we're not ready for it, it's going to kid all of us by surprise. So um, if you are in a Drupal 6 or Drupal 7 issue and you're struggling to make current platforms com compliant, keep planning for the future as well. So. Um, 
Uh, unfortunately, I don't have. I cannot give um, uh, login, uh, admin login and criteria to everybody uh, on this site. But what I can show you uh, is a simple little demo site. Uh, let's see. So um, this is a regular Drupal, Drupal page, right? Wrong. This is a page that I use the handy dandy content type called Paragraphs Demo to create. So uh, I was actually able to uh, click on our special content type that was uh, set up by the use of our Paragraphs uh, uh, mo module uh, and I can add new, new content or I can edit existing uh, content. So let's go back and edit the node that I currently have which is Hello World and I'll click on the edit button and I'll put the glasses down so I can actually see what's in front of me because as Brian says I'm old um, and now um, who can who can who wants to echo their extreme frustration with paragraphs module uh, <laughs> along, along w with me because this is a really great feature okay because we can add a full width image and we can add a lot more, but this really ought to say, add a paragraph or add a component, okay? So, yeah, we're always trying to improve, aren't we? Okay, semantic ver versioning is, should help with stuff like that. So we've got several different components set up here uh, through our paragraphs module and this demo site. I've already added two full text width components formatted text and I've already added something else, a pull quote and a full width image. Okay? And all of these can be made to be 100% AAA compliant. By the way, I encourage the use of not just paragraphs but other methods of achieving this component-based system through Drupal's API and other, other methods Use it for more than just accessibility. Use it for security. Use it for a lot of different reasons. It's, it's really kind of neat and powerful when you start thinking about it. Uh, for, for video, and the only way you can pull in a video is you got to be able to point to the caption file or some other method like that or only use a service that has um, uh, that uh, capability. So. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go too far down this rabbit hole. Instead, what I'm going to do is show you an awesome pattern lab. Wow, that's really small. Uh, talk about accessibility. Okay. Oh, if I hit full, it'll just do it. Oh, sorry. That's our 10, our 15 minute warning. Is it? Oh my God, the pressure. Okay. Um, and full is. What's that? I zoomed in. I should go zero, and then oh right, there we are. Where the hell is it? There we go. Thank you. Um, so Pattern Lab, as it happens, was created by the guy who wrote the book on atomic design. Amazing how that happens. So um, Pattern Lab actually allows your front-end developers to create a roadmap and a usable code, okay, I think this is node or mustache or something, okay, and can, you can, we can connect this code to our Drupal in, environments, but we can work from the atomic <coughs> level on up. We have a great presentation on atomic design at FFW, and someday I actually should listen to it um, so I can speak better uh, to it. But in the meantime, what I want to show you is the good work of folks like Rich at Stony Brook. This is very much a work in progress, as I understand it. So this is part of the evangelizing uh, of, of this um, uh, system. And what I want to do is, what's the URL for it and why aren't I here? The, not the Pattern Lab one, but it's just Unity. Unity.it. Unity.it. And I want to draw your attention to this neat paragraph here, right? So 
So there are a lot of reasons why they're using a component-based design system and using Pattern Lab and the atomic design development uh, process. And accessibility is one of them. And that's the way it ought to be, right? So that we have as many different uh, drivers pushing this agenda forward. We've got 10 minutes. I could keep going or we can talk uh, and have some questions. Let me go to the deck because I think I'm pretty much finished with it anyway. And why don't I just make this, do you think I need to uh, start and stop it again? Not for this, right? Um, so uh, let's just move through it. So you'll have copies, links to, to these uh, sites, right? I also wanted to show you that all these testing facilities and companies that are experts in accessibility, you'll note that they all have ads. That's awesome, right? Yeah, buyer beware. Buyer beware with all of them. Um, find a partner in this area that you are comfortable with. We're talking about producing an audit We've done some work with these folks. Um, we're happy uh, to continue the conversation with them. Uh, don't fear the audit. Remember, whether it's done internally or not, you all are buying the audit. You're buying subject matter expertise to tell you how to solve problems. So an essential element in an audit as a strategy to bring you into continuous compliance is that you need to tell the people doing the audit what you want to see in the audit, okay? You, they need to be specific when they cite and they need to propose solutions when they cite you. You're, although, and if you don't, you're not getting your money's worth when you go through an audit like this. And it's one of the reasons why uh, you do it. So I could talk a lot more about that, but I really want to uh, pick up where we left off from the introductions and talking about individual needs. We've got some folks in this room who are real experts uh, in accessibility and implementation, and I'm sure that they would be willing to share some of their ex experiences. So uh, how about we spend the last few minutes together um, engaging with one another, and I can facilitate some questions. Folks game for it? Please, and I have to repeat the question so it's recorded. So we just launched a new site and now we have uh, multilingual content on there. Hmm. We have uh, we're offices in London, the US, and a couple other countries. So how do you manage accessibility requirements from different countries when everything's on the same site? So the question is, a new site, multilingual, and multi-location. And uh, there are different requirements and regulations from those different uh, sites that have to be brought to bear uh, on, on this. Anybody else have experience working with this? Matt? Yeah. Um, and how did you solve it? Um, well, what were some of the challenges? Yeah. So the, I, don't, I don't have a great solution to it. <laughs> I don't have any spot here, but uh, I, I think Project Humor at well, Canada and the U.S. is definitely probably pretty common. But I, I, I think what we found in general is, is that while, while the regulatory regimes may vary across borders, the need really does not. And if you have a website that is uh, that is usable by a blind person, it will tend to meet the, it's not a universally true, but it will tend to meet the regulatory of, of both countries. So, so I, I think the sort of starting founding principle is like uh, think think about uh, the user before you think about like trying to tick off the legal compliance boxes. And if you're if you're starting from that place, then you usually end up somewhere good. So that is a tremendous take home from my point of view by the ever modest Matt, um, uh, and and the. the the reason why I did the training yesterday and it was on four different audit areas 
is because all of them, security, accessibility, UX, and content, was about putting your user in the center of your narrative, putting them in the center of your site, in the center of your application, okay? And once you start doing that, it becomes much easier to address all those issues in those four different areas, accessibility included. And with specifically with regard to the question around regulations, the good news is it's the World Wide Web Consortium of Guidelines. And so while the regulations may be different and are not trivial, the principles are the same and they're built off of these documents. And if you if you understand the principles and you understand development methodologies that can help you meet these guidelines and these approaches, then you'll have a much easier time serving the letter of the law in the particular region that you're in. You know, so it really goes back to basic understandings. Yes. And uh, I believe that the WCAG, um, website has a list of the countries and the laws that they follow. Excellent. And they generally. Um, the, the guideline is basically we have 2.0. It's 2.0. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, so most countries are following the WCAG um, 2.0. Um, that's good. That's a good news. So you can just get that on the worldwide concern of what. As far as legislation goes, there's only a few countries that I know that, uh, and uh, Canada is one, and the UK. They have the Equity Act of 2010. You can look at that, but that's basically. It's it's more has to do with uh, legislation or you know being sued and that sort of thing. Not really the nuts and bolts of building websites. So I mean it might be good to look at it. But the U the UN is also on top of accessibility, so you can follow them uh, on their website and uh, see what is happening around the world as far as accessibility goes. And, and it's really it's very helpful as a field to look at these from a comparative point of, of view because the sooner we adopt somebody else's, the less likely we are going to be to adopt something completely different that's our own. So in other words, there are pressures out there around standards, right? Who remembers Betamax? Okay, there are pressures out there around standards that are global and so we have a lot of organizations, for instance, now that are uh, adopting some of the procedures for GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulations that come into effect in the EU uh, March 1, right? And it's because the, the thinking is, is, is that sooner or later, we're gonna get to that level of protection in the US, number one, Number two, what I said to folks in our uh, consumer ex customer experience class yesterday was it's about perception, it's about reality, but it's about perception. We are going on to global sites all the time and we have to opt in. Well, how come we don't have to opt in in the US? So more, I think we're gonna see more and more organizations get ahead of those regulations and choose to follow things like GDPR so that, and have a message that says you have to opt in for cookies, okay? And I think the same thing is, can, can happen with accessibility. Other questions, comments, thoughts? Matt? Well, uh, so first of all, I love that phrase you just used, uh, put the user at the center of your narrative. Uh, shamelessly steal that for the rest of my career. Please do. <laughs> I'm sure I stole it from somebody else, too. Uh, in, the, in the service of that, that principle, I think a really simple thing you can do to see how your website's doing is just fire up your Mac screen reader. It comes with every Mac, like everyone in this room, with this computer is using one. Close your eyes and open up your website. It, and I guarantee here, here. you two things will happen. Like First of all, it will break your heart to see how like even a website that is technically by the letter of the not law, but by the letter of the standards, perfectly compliant is in practice really hard to use. It, it might it might be compliant, but it's it's still a bad experience. It's, it's important not to conflate those two concepts. Um, but the, the other the other thing that will happen is that you you'll like you'll get a much better sense for sort of the 
theoretical underpinnings, like why these rules exist and like what they're trying to achieve. Um, so I, yeah, I, I think that that, that pearl you gave us is, uh, should, should guide our, Thank our you. understanding. You know, Thank you. Yeah, yeah, please. I'm sorry to take over, but um, we just you know, had this experience here. But you can call your local Centers for the Blind here at Princeton. There's one over in West Windsor, and there was a team of IT people that came and actually showed us uh, how JAWS works. And oh, how, awesome. Uh, 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 um, uh, a Braille uh, keyboard works. Um, so if you can look in your local areas, I'm sure there's, there's IT people there that will come over and help you uh, to, to visualize what it's like to be a disabled person. And That's very helpful. Cruise the web. It, yeah, it was, it was a great experience. To spend the, we spent the whole day with them. It was awesome. Wow. Okay. I'm, I'm stealing that uh, and building it into this present, present presentation and what Matt said as well. Please, Brian. Uh, along those lines, uh, two years ago at New England Drupal Camp, uh, Speaker was Brian Charlson from the Carroll School for the Blind, um, and there's an audio recording of this session on the Talking Through Ball, uh, episode number 130, where you can actually hear uh, Brian go through a website and listen at half speed. Wow. It's about 20, 10, 20 times faster than we would actually listen to it, too. So, like, he navigates through, explains challenges. And like just to hear this is pretty amazing. So Brian Carlson, New England Drupal Camp? Yeah, uh, Talking Drupal episode number 130. Talking Drupal episode 130. And I say it as much as for the recording as for everyone else. Thank you. Great. Other folks? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, congratulations. Remember, to be an evangelist, you need to be a little bit nuanced, right? Historically, evangelists uh, haven't fared that well, right? We have, it's easy to have, be served up. Well, let's not get any more graphic than that, okay, as an, as an evangelist. One of the best ways to be an evangelist in your organization is to ask really good questions and to make sure that the people that have responsibility for these policies are held to providing really good answers. And, and in my experience has been in many cases, those answers will point to Drupal, uh, but they'll certainly point to good accessibility practices uh, if they're answering the questions the right, right way. So um, preaching is fine, asking questions is even better. Go out, evangelize. Thank you so much for indulging me. I hope it's been helpful. Thank you.